December, uh, Finding the Mother Tree, Discovering the Wisdom of the Forest by Suzanne Simard. Thank you. Okay. Well, the only, uh, were there any other announcements by anybody else? Uh, the only other thing I've got, uh, and uh, I want to remind you that we have 100 year anniversary book here. Uh, if you are a member in 2020, uh, you can get a free copy of this. If you are not a member for the moment, it's going to cost 20 bucks. But Suggest to agree a month or two, and I think the, the board might have to let anybody who becomes a member of the one in So I'll just give you a hint, be, be patient a little bit and get that as well. Uh, but if you, if you haven't gotten one, please let me know and I'll be glad to give you one. Okay. With that, what I'd like to do is I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight, and I'm, I'm thrilled that Bill's asked me to. Uh, let, let him do this. This is something I always enjoy doing, doing a little bit of research on our speakers. Uh, and the first thing, the first thing you're going to notice is, is that this speaker of ours is not a biologist. Matter of fact, I don't think she's really a scientist at all. Oh my gosh. It's, it's just, I, I, what's that? What the heck is going on? Why are they bringing in an English teacher of all things? Uh, and uh, let me just tell you a little bit of the story. Uh, we have a mutual friend, Carla Armbruster, our speaker tonight, and I have a mutual friend, Don Corrigan. Those of you who are familiar, Don Corrigan was the longtime editor of the Webster Kirkwood Times. And uh, as an editor, he was a, we, we considered him a friend of Wiggins because there would be numerous articles he'd write about us and always in a good light. And he'd tell us, you know, all good things that are going on. All we had to do is give him a call and say, hey, we've got this going on. Can you talk, write about it. Or we could write something and then he would edit it to his liking. And then uh, and he'd actually use that for his publication in the newspaper. Uh, the most famous one was is the very last uh, Webster Kirkwood Times. He wrote uh, about our 100th anniversary. And he did a wonderful article on, on that back then. He's been a friend of mine for a long time. Um, he also he has a second job, and that's his professor at Webster University. And he's part of the sustainability program at Webster University. Sustainability means uh, essentially using your environment in a way that does not produce a lot of trash, a lot of waste. Uh, and that can mean a whole variety of things from doing environmental good works to environment uh, to, you know, Doing you know things that in your own home that do not impact the world around you too much, and I think Carla will probably go into this in a lot more detail. So uh, Don, if you also know about anything about Don Corrigan, he writes lots of books, and he's written uh, at least close, close, yeah, close. Uh, uh, and he's written about, oh, you name the subject from the greatest disasters in Missouri to uh, weather phenomenon as just a general term, uh, term uh, roadkill. Uh, roadkill, yeah, that, that's one of the probably most famous ones, roadkill. Uh, and now he's got, yeah, he's got squirrels, that's another one. Boy, uh, I think that's the one. Okay, so he's written a whole bunch of stuff, including the last one, which is on Webster University. Webster, Webster wrote, I was talking about this. Uh, and yet, uh, last spring, he had an uh, introduction, and he invited
the first speaker, Jack speaker, and I gave it over to Lisa. So I, I think Lisa is she's not going to I messed up again. <laughs> uh, I think that might have been us. Sorry, but uh, yeah, with the mics over here. Oh, okay. That's why I was standing here. I knew it. Okay. Got to stand behind the podium. Okay. But anyway, we have, uh, so with that, what, what I'd like to do is I would like to introduce and welcome Carla Armbruster from Webster University, and she's going to tell us all about the road. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I love to talk about Thoreau. My colleague Murray Farish here from the English department will attest to that. I managed to work them into pretty much every class I teach. My children will tell you I managed to bring them up a lot at home also. Um, but this last summer, I had the opportunity to um, attend an institute offered by the National Endowment for the Humanities in Concord, Massachusetts. Uh, that was on transcendentalism, so that that's the sort of literary philosophical movement that Thoreau was part of, transcendentalism and the age of reform. So I got to learn a lot more about Thoreau and about um, all kinds of things about him and um, the place where he lived, the people um, that he knew, and the abolitionist movement that he was a big part of. Um, so I kind of put some things together and. I'm going to share them with you today. So I want to start by saying that I, we might have time for questions at the end, but if I say something, so I don't know you all, I don't know what you know and what you don't know. So if I say something and you have a question that you need to have answered so that you can continue to follow along, please just raise your hand or shout out. I'm totally fine with that, okay? Um, so with that said, I want to just comment on my title. Um, I assume that most people know that Thoreau loved nature, and this would be whether they see him as a transcendentalist in search of spiritual truths out in the woods, which is an aspect of Thoreau we talk a lot about in English classes, a naturalist delighting in the study of his local flora and fauna, an ecological thinker before the science of ecology even existed, or a society shunning hermit. And in general, those people would be right, except for the society shun shunning hermit uh, people. And I'm gonna talk about that very shortly and try to convince you that he was not a hermit. Um, Thoreau's contributions to social justice are much less well known. And that is not surprising. We tend to think of nature as a retreat from society, as a place that is free from social pressures and expectations and problems. And Thoreau's famous experiment, living for two years on the shores of Walden Pond in a tiny house that he built himself, strikes many people on its face as the poster child of this kind of retreat into nature away from society. So today, I am here to clear up some misconceptions about Thoreau, including what that time at Walden Pond was all about and the idea that he really didn't like or care about other people, a stereotype that is still hurled at nature lovers and environmentalists today. In fact, Thoreau was deeply concerned about the marginalized and oppressed, and this con concern is reflected not just in his writing, but in his active involvement in the abolitionist movement. In my talk today, I'm going to fill you in on all of that and suggest some ways we might see his concern for social justice as actually connected to rather than in opposition with his love of nature. Let's see if this goes to the next. There we go. So I'm not gonna linger on this slide very long, but I just wanted to give you some basic facts when he was born, when he, was, when he died, what he looked like. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna go on. Um, well, I'll leave it there for a second. So I am not sure how many people have even heard of Thoreau anymore. Um, my students <clears throat> seem less and less likely to even know who he was at all. Um, however, if they have, they often know him as an antisocial hermit and hypocrite. Um, and I will tell you why. Well, at least this is an example. So there are some popular perceptions of Thoreau out there that I think are related to what my students think. So there is a fairly new Apple TV series called Dickinson. 
it's kind of an anachronistic take on the life of Emily Dickinson. Um, and in one episode, she, Emily Dickinson, goes to visit Thoreau in his cabin in search of help fighting a train line that's proposed to be built near her house. Um, so the entertainment site Bustle praised this scene for its historical accuracy and explained that it reveals Thoreau to be, quote, a privileged slacker, the stereotypical guy who lives in his mother's basement and rants about society on Twitter, the kind of man that selfishly eschews all responsibilities because as a white man, he can without consequence and who wasn't as alone as he claimed to be in his book Walden. Shockingly, the site claims it's true that Thoreau's mother and sister frequently visited him to bring him food and do his laundry and other chores. Mm -hmm. He also entertained guests of his own. And yet we are expected to praise Thoreau for his independent lifestyle. So this wrongheaded assessment of what is actually a quite historically inaccurate depiction of Thoreau actually built on an earlier attempted takedown of Thoreau by the New Yorker feature writer, Catherine Schultz. So that's a little, you would expect a little better from the New Yorker than you would from Bustle, okay? <laughs> but not really, okay? Um, so in the article, which in the print version was titled Pond Scum, Schultz's position, so Schultz positioned herself as a daring truth teller going up against the received wisdom that Thoreau is a literary and cultural hero. Cherry picking evidence and ignoring crucial context, really all context, she makes an over the top case that Thoreau was a selfish, arrogant, humorless person and a bad writer. For readers who don't know much about Thoreau and who have read little or none of his work, her argument might be persuasive. But for me and others who have put in even a little time and effort to understand the man and his accomplishments, her essay is an outrageous, inaccurate, and unfair piece of self-promotion that makes me want to ask, who is the real narcissist, Thoreau or Katherine Schultz? But the point she makes despite her posture of being the first ever to point out that the emperor has no clothes, actually echo and appeal to a lot of common misperceptions. Even my doctor, who is a smart and well-educated man, the minute I mentioned Thoreau said, oh, wasn't he a hypocrite because he went home for dinner? Um, so I had to straighten him out. Um, so I'm gonna start by addressing the apparently widespread beliefs that Thoreau claimed to have lived alone during his time at Walden. <clears throat> oh, am I getting too far away? So can we, uh, maybe, but can we pause it? Um, I actually know something in the show. Maybe we should just close this out and, and restart. Um, you know, the slides aren't that important. Like, okay. do you think maybe? Well, I don't know if you have any IP on this slide deck or anything like that. No, no, I don't care. Well, um, I just don't even know what we would do to fix it. You know? We would just go with PowerPoint and reopen it. That also might help. Okay, I can try that. I don't think that'll take too long. Okay, if you don't mind. sure, I don't mind. So sorry about all these. That's issues. okay. Sorry, everyone. I uh, yeah, realized that uh, the folks on Zoom are seeing a different slide slide deck. On on uh, structural linguistics. Yeah. So yeah, not any fun for them. Well, what if I just close this one? Do you think that? Yeah, give that a try. Close that one. And I was found working from the desktop was the best way, as opposed to you know, in other words, not being slide specifically that you got open. So go to your desktop mm -hmm. and go navigate to the slide for your desktop. Okay. Well. Yeah, we get we got something else going on, Rich. Oh, you got something else going on? Yeah, I don't know how to close it from here though. Here, should I just let me just close the whole thing down? Yeah, that's it. Quick PowerPoint okay. and start again, I think. I don't know what it's asking me here. I want to save your changes. Uh no. All right. Okay, so let me reopen it. <laughs> Oh, they just both popped right back up again. That's a different one. It's an aborted attempt to make this PowerPoint. Okay. 
All right, there we go. It's the only one. Should have a Mac guy here come up. All right. All right. So now I just need to make it full screen. Okay, but we still have this issue, but I guess it's I think that's I guess it's better than we have. Yeah, access. yeah. All right. All right. So now I'm really gonna get started. So let me start by addressing the apparently widespread beliefs that Thoreau claimed to have lived alone during his time at Walden, that his top priority during that time was pursuing an independent, self-sufficient life in nature, and that he just didn't care about or like other people. So I have made, I've titled my next slide, Where He Lived and What For. This is a version of the title of the second chapter of Walden. Um, and I just wanna show you where he lived. So this is a map of the town of Concord in 1852, which was a few years after he lived at Walden Pond, but um, it was a village of maybe a little under 2000 people. They didn't all live right in here in town. Um, and you can see that, well, maybe you can't, but the houses are actually mm -hmm. labeled with the names of the families who lived in them. Um, his family lived maybe kind of over here, maybe off this map. And then this is a photo of Long Pond that was taken in the early 20th century. Um, but this is the cove where he built his house at the time that he was there. So this, um, so my point is that he did not move far away from town into an untrammeled wilderness. Um, the pond is about a 40 minute walk from his family's house at the time, at which, and he helped to build that house before he moved out to the pond. Um, and it's a 30 minute walk from the home of his friend and mentor, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who lived right there. His name is on the house. Um, the area around the pond had been logged. It was second growth forest. Um, and when Thoreau moved there, he found a landscape that was filled with traces of other people who had lived there before him. Sure, artifacts from Native Americans, but also ruins left by much more recent inhabitants, uh, mostly migrants and formerly enslaved people. Um, he actually was very interested in the stories of those people. He researched their histories and the information he recorded in his journals and to some extent reports in Walden are now the subject of a book called Black Walden, Slavery in Its Aftermath in Concord, Massachusetts. The Fitchburg Railroad Line, which only began being built the year before he moved to his cabin, went right past Walden Pond, one third of a mile from his house. And he makes very clear in his book that he was not alone there all the time. Um, people came to the pond all the time to fish, to swim, to cut ice in the winter for recreation. The road was close enough that people could and did call out to him from it. Um, sometimes when he was planting beans, they would even criticize what he was doing. Um, he explicitly frames this place where he lived for two years as an in-between space, not wilderness, not village. Even the bean field that he cultivated his first year was what he calls the connecting link between wild and cultivated fields. So the next issue I want to address is the issue of um, being alone, um, about liking to be alone and not liking other people. He did appreciate time alone, especially since it allowed him to really cultivate a relationship with the natural world and the divinity that he sensed within it. And I'm going to read you a longish quote, but it's really beautiful um, from the chapter Solitude from Walden that kind of illustrates what Thoreau got out of being alone in nature. In the midst of a gentle rain, I was suddenly sensible of such sweet and beneficent society in nature, in the very pattering of the drops, and in every sound and sight around my house, an infinite and unaccountable friendliness all at once, like an atmosphere sustaining me, as made the fancied advantages of human neighborhood insignificant, and I have never thought of them since. 
Every little pine needle expanded and swelled with sympathy and befriended me. I was so distinctly made aware of the presence of something kindred to me, even in scenes which we are accustomed to call wild and dreary, and also that the nearest of blood to me and humanist was not a person nor a villager, that I thought no place could ever be strange to me again. So despite moments like this, he had many deep, important relationships with other people. He was very close with his family. He lived with them most of his life before and after he lived at the pond. And though the villagers may have sometimes thought he was a little bit odd, he was an integral part of the community of Concord. And people sought him out as a leader for nature walks, especially if they were in search of huckleberries. He was the king of finding huckleberries. Um, he grew enough watermelons every year to throw a watermelon party for the whole town. Um, in fact, his connections to nature started with family and community. Um, when he was a child, the village doctor, Josiah Bartlett, would take groups of children on swimming and fishing expeditions, and he would go along on those. His family spent a lot of time outside. His mother would take the children on picnics, cook for them outside, get them to look at the birds, and really encouraged their interest in nature. He also had a very close friend, Ellery Channing, who often accompanied him on walks and visited him in his cabin. In Walden, he actually has a chapter called Former Inhabitants and Winter Visitors, where he describes one of those visits with Channing, whom he identifies only as the poet in the book. But if you kind of know what was going on, you know it was Channing. And he says, we made that small house ring with boisterous mirth and resound with the murmur of much sober talk making amends then to Walden Vale for the long silences. Broadway was still and deserted in comparison. While this may be the most fun Thoreau reports had him with someone else during his time at Walden, his book is filled with references to people visiting him and to him returning to town for various reasons. He never claimed or tried to be alone all the time and remained an active member of his family and community during the two years he lived at the pond. Another thing is that Thoreau is, was not as privileged as many people think. Sure, he was not an Irish railroad laborer, but his family was not particularly wealthy. His father was a shopkeeper, and when that didn't work out, he started a small factory that made pencils. At one point, his mother ran their home as a boarding house. In order to send him to Harvard, his family went without sugar. And keep in mind, there weren't a lot of other colleges to go to. So Harvard, it's not necessarily the same as, as going to Harvard today. He worked all of his life. At various times, he was a schoolmaster, a tutor, a gardener, a house painter, a carpenter, a handyman, and a surveyor. Of course, eventually a writer and a lecturer. Um, at times, he ran the family pencil factory. He was even responsible for major innovations in the manufacture of pencils. Um, to the extent that the Thoreau pencil was once considered the best pencil in the country. Um, taking two years for himself to live by the pond was a rare indulgence for him, though his work didn't completely stop for those two years either. And Ralph Waldo Emerson, the friend and mentor who was rich and owned the land by the pond where Thoreau built his cabin, didn't just hand him the opportunity. Thoreau made an agreement with Emerson that he could use the land and build the cabin in return for clearing and planting the parts of it that could be cultivated and selling the cabin back to Emerson when he was finished. He also never aspired or claimed to be completely independent. As someone who was very close with his family, he continued to help out with odd jobs around the house while he was at the pond. And yes, he often visited for Sunday dinner. I think his mother and sisters were actually kind of worried that he wasn't getting enough to eat and they were delighted when he came home to eat. Um, they also probably did continue to do his laundry with the rest of the households. And to the extent that he tried to be self-sufficient, he had other reasons than trying to attain some sort of pure status as the man who needed no one else. For one thing, he realized that relying on yourself for transportation and labor was often the cheapest way to do things, that he wanted to minimize his expenses so he wouldn't have to worry as much as usual about earning money during his two-year experiment by the pond. He famously told a friend that he could get to the nearby town of Fitchburg more quickly and pleasantly on foot than by train if the friend counted the time he spent earning the money for the train ticket as part of the length of the journey. He also understood very well 
the way that industrial capitalism fostered inequality, writing in Walden that I cannot believe that our factory system is the best mode by which men may get clothing. The condition of the operatives is becoming every day more like that of the English. In other words, very bad, oppressed, taken advantage of, beaten down. And it cannot be wondered at since, as far as I have heard or observed, the principal object is not that mankind may be well and honestly clad, but unquestionably that corporations may be enriched. Doing things for himself kept him out of that system as much as possible. So you might ask, why was he there? Um, his most immediate goal was to write the story of a river, river trip he had taken with his brother, John. Um, John had died of tetanus, which he had contracted by cutting himself when he was shaving three years before Thoreau went to the pond. So John died in 1842. The two of them had been very, very close. They had run a school together according to their own very progressive principles for three years um, before they had to close due to John's ill health from tuberculosis. Um, and the story is really tragic. So he cut himself shaving. He didn't know that you know, he had contracted tetanus. When the wound wasn't healing correctly, he went to the doctor. The doctor didn't think too much of it either, but then he collapsed on his way home and he started getting the neurological symptoms of locked jaw and he died a, a day or two later. Henry nursed him the whole time and John died in Henry's arms. And Henry was so traumatized that he developed sort of sympathetic symptoms of locked jaw himself without actually having the disease. And he had nightmares on the anniversary of his brother's death for the rest of his life. So the very important relationship, a very tragic loss. Um, and he wanted to write a story, the story of this wonderful week that they had together um, while he was at the cabin. Um, in a broader sense though, it was also an experiment in living. So you gotta think about his state of mind when he went to live by that pond on July 4th, 19, 1845. His brother had died unexpectedly, tragically. Thoreau himself was probably already ill with the tuberculosis that would kill him at age 44. Knowing in this very real way that his time on this earth was limited, Thoreau wanted to make the most of it. He wanted to strip his life down to the bare minimum in terms of the basic needs of food, clothing, and shelter, and fire, because they were in Massachusetts, <laughs> fire in the winter, so he could free up as much time as possible for the things that were the most important to him. And for him, those were reading, writing, and walking in the woods and fields of Concord. As he wrote very famously, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. And he wanted to share what he learned with his friends and neighbors, whom he saw toiling away, often accruing debt to own things they might not really need. As environmentalist Bill McKibben explained, one of the most powerful things Thoreau does in Walden is encourage us to ask, how much is enough? We may understand that time is money, but Thoreau reminds us that money is also time. And that, and this is a quote from Walden, the cost of a thing is the amount of life which is required to be exchanged for it immediately or in the long run, end quote. Sharing this insight demonstrated through his own experiences that it is not necessary to live a life of quiet desperation, that as he put it, there are as many ways to live as there can be drawn radii from one center could be seen as an act of empathy and love. So if he wasn't a privileged misanthropic poser, what was Thoreau? Among other things, he was a committed student of natural history and an accomplished botanist who collected hundreds of specimens. He also recorded in his journals when hundreds of different local flowers opened for the first time every spring, year after year. So these are not his drawings. These are um, from a book called Thoreau's Wildflowers, and the drawings are by Barry Moser. But these are flowers that he wrote about and that he observed. Um, he was, and he was committed to accuracy. He once wrote, I often visited a particular plant four or five miles distant, half a dozen times within a fortnight that I might know exactly when it opened. 
His meticulous records turned out to be incredibly useful to scientists who are currently studying the impact of climate change on spring flowering times. Richard Primack of Boston University and others have documented when these same flowers bloom today. So that's what this book is about. Um, Walden warming, climate change comes to Thoreau's woods. Um, so they learned that in an average year, flowers will bloom about 11 days earlier now than they did in Thoreau's time. For example, high bush blueberries always flowered in mid-May in Thoreau's time, but now they bloom in the first week in April. So those plants are adapting to the change in temperature, but the scientists point out that might not be all good if their pollinators haven't adjusted as well. And there are a lot of flowers that Thoreau observed that are not changing their blooming times based on the, um, the, the temperature, and so they are endangered. This includes anemones, buttercups, and asters. Um, Thoreau also read the natural historians and scientists of his time voraciously, including Darwin. He even corresponded with and sent specimens to Louis Chagassi, who was commanding audiences in the thousands for his natural history lectures in Boston. Inspired by these activities, Thoreau, Thoreau grew more and more engrossed by his own studies of what we would now call the ecology of the Concord area and made this into his major focus by the early 1850s. Um, so, you know, a few years really after he came back from the cabin. This was also the period when he was turning the notes he took in his journal during his time at the pond into the manuscript for Walden, which was published in 1854. Arguably, you can see his new ecological vision emerging in its chapters, with Thoreau's transcendentalist focus on nature as a vehicle for personal spiritual enlightenment shifting to what we would now call a more biocentric perspective that values nature for its own sake. For example, literary critic Lawrence Buell tracked the number of times Thoreau uses the pronoun I in Walden, and he found that it, in, it decreases as the book goes on. Um, and he takes that as evidence that he's thinking less about his own spiritual enlightenment and more about just the world around him for its own sake. Um, in his chapter, The Bean Field, which is honestly one of my favorite chapters, Thoreau questions the rights of human beings to force the land to conform to their purposes, characterizing his own cultivation of beans as an act of forceful domination, making, quote, the earth say beans instead of grass, end quote. Eventually, he comes to the conclusion that the woodchucks that were the bane of his agricultural efforts, and he hated these woodchucks. I mean, it comes up in Walden, it comes up in his journals, he really struggled with them. But by the end of the bean field, he has reconciled himself to the idea that they have as much right to the beans that he's growing as he did, since the sun and rain played the largest part in the beans growth and their results are, quote, meant to be harvested by all. Towards the end of his life, he even wrote several essays that made arguments for what we would now call conservation. So the two most famous are the succession of forest trees in 1860, which presents a scientific theory accounting for patterns of forest succession. I probably don't need to explain succession to you guys. Okay. <laughs> um, and a passionate argument for purposeful forest management. Um, another of his late essays, Wild Apples, paints a vision in which communities would combine to create national preserves, taking selected lands out of the system of private property and holding them in trust for all as, quote, a common possession forever for instruction and recreation. Such land, if forested, was not to be cut, but to, quote, stand and decay for higher uses. So that sounds a lot like our national, maybe park system, um, the will, you know, the designated wilderness areas. So he had that idea in 1862. So another way people, another facet of Thoreau that, that people might recognize is as a champion of individualism and self-reliance. A lot of people think of him as a fiery anti-government defender of the individual's right and responsibility to follow their own conscience due to his January 1948 lecture, Rights and Duties of the Individual in Relation to Government, also known simply as On the Duty of Civil Disobedience. So this lecture was occasioned by something that happened during, that's me, <laughs> during his time at Walden Pond. Um, 
It was July of 1846. He went into town to pick up a mended shoe. He happened to cross the path of the tax collector sitting in Staples. He had not paid his poll tax since 1842. And he did this as an act of defiance. And he was imitating Bronson Alcott, Louisa May Alcott's father, who had also not paid his poll tax and had already gone to jail for it. So um, he refused to pay. So uh, Staples was actually going to be stepping down as tax collector, and he just wanted to get everything taken care of before he was done. And so he grabbed the row and said, you know, please go ahead and pay your taxes. And Thoreau refused. And Sam Staples said, I will pay them for you. And Thoreau wouldn't let him. And so he took him to jail and he spent that one night in jail. And someone, um, and we're still not sure, 100% sure who it was, someone else paid his tax and he was freed. So the reason he refused to pay his poll tax was as a protest against the imminent annexation of Texas into the United States. So he and a lot of other people saw this as an issue of imperialism because Mexico still claimed that land um, and even an even bigger deal, an issue of slavery, since many Texans were enslavers and the state would certainly come into the union as a slave state. So he refused to pay as a statement that he was withdrawing his membership in the country. Um, he was also protesting slavery. He could, could not condone what it was doing, so he wanted no part of it. It was mm -hmm. the version of saying, I don't want to belong to this club anymore. Um, so as an act of civil disobedience, this was pretty mild. Um, and it's really only known because of the essay he wrote about it and the impact it had on much more famous activists like Mahatma Gandhi, excuse me, yeah, Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King. Um, But it's important to understand that that speech was part of a much longer, larger pattern of abolitionist activism in Thoreau's life, and an even longer pattern of taking principled stands against injustice. So Laura Dasso Walls, who has written a wonderful biography of Thoreau, sees this pattern beginning shortly after he graduated from college. When he returned to Concord, he took a job as a teacher at the Concord Academy, which is where he went to school. Um, while his philosophy of education was quite progressive, the school committee insisted that he flog the students. Apparently, this was considered just part of a good education is that you would get beaten sometimes. Um, so he did not want to do this. But one day, one of the uh, board members visited his class. Yeah, oh, sorry. Um, so one of the board members visited his class and really pushed him. So he took what was called a feral, which was a ruler that was specifically made for hitting children with. It was like flattened out on the end and hit at least two of the children. Um, and he felt terrible about it. The next day he came back and told the children that corporal punishment was against his conscience and then he quit. That was 10 days after he started. So, <laughs> um, he had also come home to a home that was immersed in the abolitionist movement. In 1837, which was the year he graduated from Harvard, the Concord Female Charitable Society became the Concord Female Anti-Slavery Society. So female anti-slavery societies were becoming very common at that time in the Northeast, but the Concord Female Anti-Slavery Society became one of the most sort of active and influential ones. And in part, that was because the founders were related to Emerson and Thoreau um, prom and other prominent transcendentalist writers, Bronson Alcott as well. And they used their close relationships with these more with these prominent men to influence their thinking. I don't think anybody had to influence Bronson Alcott, but Emerson took some persuading. He had reached international recognition for his essays and lectures at the time that the society was founded, but he had never spoken or written about slavery. It just seemed too controversial. Um, in about 1844, after absolutely relentless pestering by his neighbor, Mary Merrick Brooks, who was a pretty amazing woman, and his wife, who kept holding abolitionist meetings at his house, he finally spoke out about, against slavery publicly at one of the annual fairs that the Female Anti-Slavery Society held for fundraising. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a second. 
Thoreau was not as well known. He wasn't really known as all, at all outside his town at this point, but he was in a similar situation. Some of the town's most radical abolitionists were his mother and sisters and his aunts. Um, so his mother, Cynthia, his sisters, Helen and Sophia, his aunts, Mariah and Jane Thoreau, and some good friends of the family, the Wards. Um, their house was even a station on the Underground Railroad. Um, another factor in his abolitionism, Laura Dosso Walls thinks, was um, his brother dying in 1842. Um, she says that this experience opened Thoreau up radically to the world. Injustice to another made him storm with a passionate and sleepless rage that powered his great writings of political protest. And the natural world spoke to him of the spiritual ideals he and John had shared. So later that same year, he helped to bring what we are now calling the self-emancipated former slave, instead of saying escape, we now, the, the um, I guess the term of art is self-emancipated because you don't want to acknowledge that anyone had the, the right to hold them as slaves. So the, he helped bring the self-emancipated former slave and abolitionist Frederick Douglass, and you probably have heard of Frederick Douglass. He was just incredibly influential and wrote some amazing um, speeches, but also autobiographies that we still read today in literature classes for sure. So Thoreau helped to bring him to speak at the County Anti-Slavery Society in October, along with two of the most prominent and radical white abolitionists in the country, William Lloyd Garrison and Wendell Phillips. Um, then he was so impressed with Phillips that when he got a position as a curator of the Concord Lyceum, so the Lyceum was a place that basically organized lectures that people went to for entertainment and improvement and that sort of thing. So he advocated to bring Phillips back to speak at the Lyceum just to, to talk about slavery that December. This was very controversial. Um, two years later, in August 1844, is when Emerson took the public step you know, into the abolition movement that I mentioned earlier. The Female Anti-Slavery Society was holding a fundraising gala that celebrated the 10th anniversary of the emancipation of the slaves in the West Indies. So this was a political thing, right? They're saying the West Indies emancipated their slaves. We haven't done it here in America. Um, Emerson was already, you know, planning to give his first anti-slavery address at this event. Frederick Douglass was in attendance but the minister of the church where those lectures were usually held closed his doors and refused to let them speak. So Thoreau ran to the courthouse, opened it up and rang the bell to draw everyone there and the event proceeded. He even, during his time at Walden Pond, just a couple of days after he returned from his night in jail, hosted a meeting of the Concord Female Anti-Slavery Society in the area around his cabin. Um, he also, um, you know, hid or hosted uh, a self-emancipated slave overnight in the cabin, at least one while he was there. Um, during this time, he also gave the lecture that would become known in its published form as civil disobedience. Um, but some of his later lectures were much more passionate direct statements against the system of slavery and in favor of fighting it by pretty much any means necessary. And that's where we come to this slide. So this is an advertisement of an event where Thoreau gave his lecture, Slavery in Massachusetts. So this was all precipitated by the capture and return to his enslaver of a self-emancipated man from Virginia, Anthony Burns, in Boston during the summer of 1854. Um, and Massachusetts was a, was probably known as the safest place for self-emancipated slaves it, during this time. Um, in 1850, though, the Fugitive Slave Act was passed, which made it um, basically illegal for anyone to help an escape a, a self-emancipated slave. Um, it actually made it required that you would help someone who was trying to recapture or re-enslave um, someone else. And it gave the federal government the power to enforce all of this, even if a state, for example, had outlawed slavery. So it really changed things. And so Anthony Burns, I think, was the third self-emancipated man who was um, captured in Boston. The first two, I think, were, at least the first one was actually saved by a mob and spirited away. Um, 
but Burns wasn't. Um, I, I mean, the 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 feds or whoever was enforcing this were, were getting wise. And so they managed to hold on to him, even though there was a riot around the courthouse when the decision was made that he should be sent back. Um, and in fact, the uh, the Massachusetts, let's see, the, the federal government had to even send troops in to keep the peace as he was marched to a ship in Boston Harbor. So all of the abolitionists were absolutely as worked up as was humanly possible um, about this event. And just a, a few days later, maybe a well, not long afterwards, um, the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society held this event on the 4th of July. Um, the American flag was blown upside down. William Lloyd Garrison burned a copy of the Constitution. These people were very upset. And Thoreau was one of the eminent speakers um, who delivered a lecture in which he declared, show me a free state and a court truly of justice, and I will fight for them if need be, but show me Massachusetts and I refuse her my allegiance. He went on to say that my old, and worthiest pursuits have lost much of their attraction. And I feel that my investment in life here is worth many percent less since Massachusetts last deliberately sent back an innocent man, Anthony Burns, to slavery. I dwelt before, perhaps, sorry, I dwelt before perhaps in the illusion that my life passed somewhere only between heaven and hell. But now I cannot persuade myself that I do not dwell wholly within hell. But his most controversial abolitionist statement was his defense of John Brown after his arrest for the raid on Harper's Ferry. Um, and I should also add that Thoreau knew John Brown. He wasn't just a, a, a symbol that he romanticized. Um, John Brown had visited Concord a couple of times. He ate lunch at Thoreau's mother's table. Okay, so um, he delivered a plea for Captain John Brown as a lecture several times after Brown was sentenced to hang. In 1859, and you probably know this story, Brown and 21 other men seized the federal armory at Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, um, where they had, were storing about 100,000 rifles and muskets. His plan was to take all of those arms, arm all of the enslaved men in the area and create a violent rebellion against the slaveholding South. After 36 hours, they were overwhelmed by federal forces. So 12 of the raiders were killed on the spot, five escaped, Brown and the rest were arrested. In his speech, Thoreau praised Brown as the ultimate example of someone living by the dictates of his conscience, risking his own life to fight injustice and criticized people who espoused abolitionist beliefs but thought Brown had gone too far. Comparing Brown to Jesus Christ, he declared misguided, Garrulous, insane, vindictive, so ye write in your easy chairs. And thus he wounded responds from the floor of the armory, clear as a cloudless sky, true as the voice of nature is. No man sent me here, it was my own prompting and that of my maker. I acknowledge no master in human form. And his most daring act was not refusing to pay his poll tax, but rather helping one of John Brown's raiders escape to Canada. One of the five who escaped, Francis Jackson Miriam, was physically and perhaps mentally a bit fragile, but he was very fired up about the raid and he had been able to provide money to fund it. Um, he had actually made it to Canada, but came back to Boston the day John Brown was hanged. So there's our mental fragility. <laughs> um, and he ran into some of the other abolitionists. They thought he seemed pretty emotionally unstable and they convinced him to head back to Canada. But he went to Concord instead. <laughs> and then he ran into another person friendly to his cause who arranged a safe place for him for the night and for Thoreau to take him to the train for Canada in Emerson's horse and wagon the next day. So there would have been far more serious consequences than a night in jail if Thoreau had been caught aiding and abetting a wanted man who probably would have been hanged if apprehended. So even knowing all of this, it's still possible to see these two passions of Thoreau's, nature and social justice, as competing ones. Even he did sometimes. The remembrance of my country spoils my walk, he wrote in slavery in Massachusetts. And this is a man who took his walks very seriously. Um, but it's possible, it's also possible to see them as connected, as coming from the same core values. 
So as a transcendentalist, and here's your English literature lecture, um, he believed that each human being had the potential to net, connect with and experience the deepest universal spiritual truths for themselves by playing, paying close, unfiltered attention to the signs and patterns of these truths in the world around them, especially the natural world. In Walden, he wrote, let us spend one day as deliberately as nature and not be thrown off the track by every nutshell and mosquito's wing that falls on the rails. Let us ride, rise early and fast or break fast, gently and without perturbation. Let company come and let company go. Let the bells ring and the children cry. Determined to make a day of it, let us settle ourselves and work and wedge our feet downward through the mud and slush of opinion and prejudice and tradition and delusion and appearance, through church and state, through poetry and philosophy and religion, till we come to a hard bottom and rocks in place which we can call reality and say, this is, and no mistake. And he believed that this search for enduring truths was the ultimate and best purpose of a human life. He critiques his society for their preoccupation with material belongings because that gets in the way of becoming better people. He wrote, before we can adorn our houses with beautiful objects, the walls must be stripped and our lives must be stripped and beautiful housekeeping and beautiful living be laid for a foundation. Now, a taste for the beautiful is most cultivated out of doors where there is no house and no housekeeper. This is what he was trying to do at Walden. But he also understood that you must have your basic needs met before you can take on this sort of moral and spiritual quest, which the Unitarian minister, William Ellery Channing, called self-culture. And that you needed to be free to pursue your path, not owned by or beholden to others, figuratively or literally. And of course, the enslaved were literally owned by others and could not call their bodies or their children their own, much less their time. This has, had to be part of his motivation. But Laura Dasso Walls thinks it goes deeper than this, and I agree. If the purpose of human life is to seek out the deepest spiritual truths, what Thoreau calls reality in the passage I just read, isn't it possible that an expansive understanding of justice is one of those truths? And that working towards that sort of justice could be part of becoming a better person, of living according to the principles that he developed through his spiritual questing and contemplation? When you combine his passion, for justice, with his growing understanding of the ecological complexity of natural systems and his biocentric sense of the value and importance of nature for its own sake, you get what we might see as a view that anticipates the contemporary environmental justice movement. We can see this best if we go back to 1845, when Thoreau gave a Concord Lyceum lecture on Concord rivers. In it, he described an experience on the Musketacook River, back when he took his river trip with his brother John in 1839. As they approached a dam recently constructed near the town of Bilrica, he noticed that three species of formerly abundant fish, salmon, shad, and alewives, were nowhere to be seen. The dam had blocked them from their normal migration route. So this is what he says um, to these missing fish. Poor shad. Where is thy redress? When nature gave thee instinct, gave she thee the heart to beat thy fate? Still wandering the sea and thy scaly armor to inquire humbly at the mouths of rivers if man has perchance left them free for thee to enter, armed with no sword, but mere shad, armed only with innocence and a just cause. I, for one, am with thee, and who knows what may avail a crowbar against that Bilrica dam. So he, he, and he doesn't confine his sympathy to the shad. He also extends it to the ordinary people adversely affected by the dam. They could no longer catch fish for food or manure, and the dam had flooded the meadows for many miles upstream, taking away what had been a necessary source of hay for local farmers who fed it to their livestock. And thus, he says, at length, it would seem that the interests, not of the fishes only, but of the men of Wayland, of Sudbury, of Concord, demand the leveling of that dam. 
doing right by nature and doing right by human beings, especially those who are less privileged and likely ignored by the wealthy capitalists and politicians who make decisions like where to build a dam are not in conflict here, but in fact can and should be seen as necessary to each other. And that is the thought I'm gonna end with. Thank you. We have uh, plenty of time. Uh, are there any questions in the room for the talk? So why do you think I'm going to grab a drink of water because I forgot to bring a water bottle? <laughs> And Lisa, if uh, easy to do, can you uh, unmute the uh, the Zoom audience and uh, see if we have any questions there? Uh, that's stuff from earlier. Problem, problem. Technology problems. I have to notice that Roe actually passed away just at the beginning of the Civil War. So we never, you know, very fought for freedom for African Americans. Um, and yet we did not get to see its fruition when it finally, at least on paper, so yeah. I'm saying say yeah. uh, any notes about the role beyond his death as at the end of the Civil War and you know, maybe influence Lincoln or something like that. I don't know of anything like that. Um, okay. Yeah, but I can try to find out. <laughs> yeah, that, it is true. It's sad. I mean, he died very young. Um, he did lead a pretty full life, I would say. And I, my sense okay. is that he was satisfied that he had really gotten the most out of it. Well, and I don't know what the how Gandhi got a hold of the Rhodes writings, but that would be a very significant. Influence, yeah, absolutely. I want to thank you for reading passages from Walden and uh, and the Concord River. Uh, that I think is, you know, uh, such a beautiful writer. So, I mean, prose poetry, and uh, you know, I, I think. Well, I'm glad you book. appreciate that because really the book is so stocked with wordplay and ideas. <coughs> to really <clears throat> until you just pluck a little piece out and let yourself pay attention to it the other thing that it is is that the parts of it are very funny when when i when Catherine schultz said that he was humorless i was like well i guess you don't know how to read his book <laughs> yeah um so yeah he loved wordplay yeah. mm -hmm. yes do we know how much contact there was between emerson and that's a great question. Um, I suspect it was more Thoreau going to Emerson than Emerson coming to him. Yeah, but he was back and forth all the time. When I was there this summer, I actually walked that, and you pretty much have to go past Emerson's house to get there. You know, so like between where the center of town anyway, and on the pond. So. I was at his cabin a couple of years ago and I found a picture of his cabin. Great. And, yeah. Yeah, that's actually a facsimile that they they recreated. Um, he, he did sell back then. And it was very close to his um, his relatives. And oh, like you say, he could walk back and forth with his dirty laundry. Although if you read what he had to say about the bare minimum necessary for clothing, I doubt he had to say so, <laughs> you tried to keep it very simple. What's the lead? What, what I just liked it. I don't know. That's a I, Oh, I should have known you guys were. Sure. <laughs> it was just a hard well, It's like a cherry leaf, maybe. It's very long. It's long stems. Yeah, that's... It's probably not a good one. It's not a hot water. <laughs> so I thought it was interesting you made a comment about time and money and how it exchanges one for the other. Um, yet I'm sure he thought his time was well spent and generated no money. Mm -hmm. But how did he 
a person's job was not something was a career, was something they love doing. They did it because it put food on the table and it was most of the time. So if you worked in fields or you worked at a store, mm -hmm. it was like, I'm so glad I can be a shop owner. Like, I'm glad I can feed myself and my family. Mm -hmm. um, yet he spent time, he didn't generate money. So as soon as we have used their time, only worth dollars of his time was a gift, really. Mm -hmm. To be able to spend time just thinking, right? Well, it was a gift he gave to himself. I mean, he very, if you read the book, he very deliberately <laughs> figured out how to minimize all the things he needed to spend money on so that he could have it. Yeah, well, it wasn't, I think a lot of times people think he would sacrifice. Oh, I'm going to do the Bible to become some kind of a saint. And for him, it was a, an indulgence. It was, it was a figure to do himself. It sounds like a crap. Sounds pretty good to me sometimes. Mm -hmm. I did, in the fact, similarly, he cut that they also had a family band. Not comfortable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, what you just described is sort of a you, someone that was able to get the work life balance right, <laughs> as opposed to many of us that work either one. We rejected that work ethic culture that we have in America. It was like, you know, don't work unless you need to for the money or if you love it, right? He, he really thought that work for its own sake was stupid. So, which is, which is a pretty radical opinion in America. Yeah. Just listening to what I did. Oh, I'm sure. sent me a, a text saying that the. Not that close enough to the. He thinks that the parole would have tapered and he put his. Uh, Perhaps. Yeah. I think that Perhaps. Yeah, I would have to think about that one a little bit. Yeah. I um Maybe. I, Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, he thought like in the like he really thought everyone needed to live according to their own conscience. But I think he also understood that people need each other and that people should take care of each other. So I don't think he would be like, no, everyone has to earn the right to have health care. I, I don't I don't necessarily see him going that direction. So where did he get his life before he and all of while he was living at the farm? Well, he grew he beans. beans. He grew beans and he sold them. He grew a lot of beans and he sold them. Primarily, I think that was his, the way he earned money then. He earned a lot of money as a surveyor. He was a surveyor. Um, he, you know, people would pay him to dig their gardens. Um, he, you know, was a pretty good carpenter. So he got some of that kind of work. Um, he, did, he did pretty much whatever people would pay him for. And he did, at certain times, he did have to run the pencil factory for his family, like especially after his father died. Yeah, um, about your, your question, uh, or your wife's question. Yes. Uh, I think one of the earliest chapters in Walden is Tommy. Mm -hmm. And that that's the first the long chapter and pretty dense um, but i think that would be a place to start mm -hmm. yeah and economy is really different than the rest of the book economy is really him going through the process of simplifying like he's figuring out what is the bare minimum that i need what is just society telling me what i need and then he's taught you know making all of these parallels between spiritual economy wow money economy um and then when he finally gets everything sorted out that's when he finally gets the good stuff where he's able to really pay attention to the nature going on around him um and so the rest if you a lot of times that chapter gets anthologized and the rest of the book is very different than that chapter it's much more of what you would think of as nature writing yeah i have a couple questions online but what i'm in the chat yes. Uh, I got one one uh, message from uh, Linux Pico, which uh, I very much enjoyed Thoreau one in high school 25 years ago. He did not strike me as a particularly self-involved person, but more as a lover of nature. I was previously unaware of attempts to diminish his reputation a few decades ago. Uh, is the mudslinging of Thoreau a fairly recent popular development or trend? 
and uh, it's a great, great talk and that's very good experience. Oh, well, thank you very much. I would say <laughs> that these ideas have been out there for a while. However, I, I think this is just a guess. Fewer and fewer people are actually reading the book. <laughs> and so they're sort of getting stronger because nobody knows any better and, and can tell people, no, that's not true. And it's also not an easy book to read. So I think there are people who, I mean, I don't mean this to sound kind of sending, but I think there are people who read it and don't understand it. Um, maybe if they're forced to in school, you know, some people, I have found some people just take to it like a duck to water and they love it. And I've had students read this book and quit their jobs because they were inspired. You know, they didn't want to waste their lives doing something they hated, you know? Um, and then other people just can't make any sense of it. I guess there's a particular amount of historical records that could be in that context for the world to be. There's a wonderful edition that's put out by Yale University Press that has, so every page has two columns and one column is text and one column is notes yeah. and it explains everything and it's wonderful. That's a perfect way to read. Yeah. Kind of like Moby Dick. Yeah. The guy, the guy who did, <laughs> the guy who did all of those notes is the like archivist at um, the Walden Woods Project where they have a bunch of um, Thoreau and Walden stuff. Um, there was a time when they were, there were the attempt to de build some developing, to develop some housing around Walden Pond. And people, a lot of people were shocked because they thought it was protected, but it wasn't. And so people came together and um, raised money and put a lot of it in some kind of a trust. And it's called the Walden Woods Project. And one of the main People involved in that was Don Henley from the Eagles, if you know, because he loved her. So it's so now there's they have a beautiful building and a lot of cool artifacts and this great archivist Ed Kramer, who's kind of, I guess he's really a librarian and he does all of this, did all of the research and um, made all of the notes and it's a great what was his name? Jeff Kramer. It's like C R A M E R. I think. But it's Yale University Press. They have annotated editions, I think, of all of his writing. At least the, uh, you know, yeah. Do we have any uh, comments or questions from people on the phone? Someone's talking. Oh, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I forgot. Here are my two most important sources. I used a number of sources, but if you wanted to do more reading, this is Laura Dasso Wells' biography, Henry David Thoreau, A Life. Um, fairly recent, really beautifully written, very accessible. She's a great storyteller. Um, and then this is... Uh, an account of the anti-slavery movement in Concord and this big focus on the women because they were the movers and the shakers of the whole thing. They just couldn't be the, be the um, prominent speakers because women weren't allowed. Like, um, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you for listening, because these are things I try to tell everyone, but most people don't stick around. <laughs> no, thank you, Carla. I'd like to apologize to you and uh, everybody online and in the room for our technical difficulties. We appreciate you being flexible and rolling with us. Uh, also to say thanks uh, from Wigness, uh, we'd like to give you a couple things. Uh, first, an honorary uh, year membership to Wigness, uh, as well as uh, Rich Toma's Labor of Love, uh, the, oh, our wow. 100 years of um, Wigness history book. Thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate you coming and talking with us. And well, I really enjoyed it. And I was already thinking I needed to join the book group. So, uh, now, yes, yes. Yeah. Talk to John. Yeah. So, maybe I'll see some of you again. Thank you. Yes. And we have the uh, room for another. 20 minutes or so uh, for those in attendance. We appreciate you setting, putting up the chairs. Um, also a couple of announcements I forgot. Uh, Bert has brought some, some books for sale. Uh, yeah. I know Father Sullivan's Insect and Plants book. Yeah, a few of those. Yeah. 
the hats. It might be a bad uh, patch. In the, I'm not sure. Okay. <coughs> um, one other thing, it, I didn't get a lot of info, but the librarian was telling me there is a speaker coming in this room tomorrow night at seven, talking about uh, climate change and global warming. Uh, sorry, that's all the info I have, but I wanted to make sure I shared that as well. Uh, but other than that, Rich, anything else? Yeah. Lisa, do you have anything? Uh, just once again, I want to say I'm sorry for... Uh... <laughs> missing my turn and driving three quarters of the way around Nashville instead of just a quarter <laughs> of the way around Nashville. Uh, no worries. We know you have things going on. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. See you next time.